Welcome to episode four of Broadcast Booth Stories Inside the Headsets of Play by Play. I'm Brian Jensen, the host of this program, and you know, I'm really excited about what we've got going on here today. We're going to be talking to the uh, voice of SMU Athletics from Dallas, Texas, uh, Rich Phillips. But before we do that, just wanted to give you a quick update of some of the things, uh, some of the ways you can get uh, uh, this Broadcast Booth episode, whether it's video or just the podcast audio. Yes, we are now serving up the podcast. You can get that, of course, from just about any of your favorite services uh, that you get your subscriptions from podcasts, Apple Podcasts, of course, Spotify, Pandora, etc., etc. And then, of course, video, you know where to get that from the YouTube channel that we have broadcast booth. So uh, now that we've got that business out of the way, want to get right to our uh, guest from today, and that is Rich Phillips. As I mentioned, Rich, Welcome from Dallas. Good to uh, see you. Good to hear from you, Brian. Uh, you and I have known each other 25, 30 years, probably in the business. So uh, great to be on with you and excited about your new venture you've got here. Well, I appreciate that. It's been a lot of fun so far, and I'm really looking forward to the stories that you're going to share because uh, you and I talked a little bit before the uh, setup of this, and I know you've got some dandies. Yeah, yeah, it's been uh, 20 long years now. shouldn't say long years, but they are, <laughs> aren't they? <laughs> 20 years, though, I've been uh, doing SMU football and almost as long on the basketball side, too. It's been a lot of fun over the years. Well, and before that, I wanted to share with uh, the, the guests what you did prior because I think this is something that um, really kind of catches everybody up on, on, on where you are now. You spent a lot of time at the ticket, and for those of you that are not in Dallas, that's a radio station, one of the best sports radio stations in all of America right here in Dallas, and boy, you had a big piece uh, of that puzzle for quite a long time. Yeah, I spent uh, 18 years there uh, from 95 to uh, 2014. Uh, before I left there. It was an amazing experience. A lot of great, talented guys that I worked with. I still listen every day and uh, left there, went to Texas Motor Speedway for six years and now I'm venturing out into the real estate world while still keeping my uh, hand in the broadcast side a little bit as well. Which I, I find it kind of interesting just for the two of us because uh, you're now in the real estate industry at what is a very hot time in the Dallas-Fort Worth market, that's for sure. I, I went in after my television days, went into the commercial real estate side of things for 19 years, um, but I was not in the brokerage side of things. I was marketing communications, um, that type of thing, digital marketing, but it was a lot of fun because it was during a time, uh, early on there was a bit of a dip, but after that, boy, things really took off and it was a lot of fun to, to see uh, the exp and experience that type of industry. How much fun are you having or is it a uh, pretty big, pretty big uh, kind of a learning curve for you at this point? Definitely a pretty big learning curve. A lot of fun stuff, though, and uh, it is, uh, you mentioned the market, it's as crazy as it's ever been, uh, really all over Texas, but certainly right here in Dallas-Fort Worth, too, and uh, just trying to find houses and still some marketing there, too. By the way, I do marketing and communications there, just trying to sell my services and sell some houses. No doubt about that. I mean, marketing is uh, you know, a huge part of just about any sales side of things. But okay, so we, we talked a little bit about your background with, uh, with the ticket and uh, what got you going. Um, I'm curious, as you got into SMU um, broadcasting, though, um, you know, we're going to talk a lot about just some experiences that have happened in the booth or have happened down on the field that then you know, people want to hear, well, what was that reaction like inside the booth? You know, what, uh, what, was, what was your experience? because they can't get in there. They can certainly feel like they are because of the way you present the broadcasts. But the one I want to jump to first uh, is the one that you threw out to me uh, as we prepared. What was your most memorable call? And if you'll, you'll kind of set it up, and I think people will understand why the tie-in and the conversation about the ticket is important to uh, what ended up after this, uh, after this broadcast. Well, this was, I believe it was October of 2005. SMU was playing in Birmingham against UAB. And keep in mind, we were almost three full years since we had seen a road victory. These were hard times, as you <laughs> well remember, Brian, at SMU yeah. back then. And um, with 23 seconds left, they get the ball back at their own 20-yard line. 
down uh, 27 to 22, and you think, there's no way, right? No way this is going to happen. Lo and behold, Jared Romo completes a 20-yard pass for a first down. They complete a nine-yard pass and go out of bounds, complete a 20-yarder out of bounds. Yeah, they had no timeouts, by the way, too. And uh, they were at the 31-yard line of UAB with three seconds left in the game. And uh, I got to tell you, it's one of the most magical things I've ever seen from a single play when I've been calling games. Well, here it is. Here we go. Final play coming up with three seconds. 27-22. UAB leads SMU. The Mustangs at the 31 of UAB. They've got to throw it into the end zone. Block up front, man. Block up front. Four wide receivers. Romo in a shotgun. Looking left side towards the end zone. Bobby Chase is there. Unbelievable! Unbelievable! I can't believe it! Woo! Holy cow! Woo! Now, you know, that went on a little bit longer. Um, oh, yeah. and, and, and here's the thing. Uh, so tell me what happened after that. Well, then, by the way, the other guy screaming wildly with me there was my buddy Craig Swan, uh, known as the Hitman from Quitman when he played at SMU in the 90s and was <laughs> my color analyst back in those days. And so uh, Bad Radio, which was at the time the midday show, noon to three yeah. on the ticket, uh, up until just about a year and a half ago, uh, they were still in that time slot. And they did a thing in football season every week called Homer Call of the Week. And uh, I'm pretty sure we routed that week and winning Homer <laughs> Call of the Week. And then when they get to the end of the regular season in the NFL, if uh, in January they go on to the playoffs and all the way to where they have the Homer Bowl champion declared, we were right. proudly named the 2005 Homer Call of the Year for that moment right there. Well, that, that had to have been a, a proud moment for you, no doubt. Now, there, it, there wasn't a little inside bias, was there? Uh, from them? No, I don't think so. <laughs> well, come on. I know, you, I, I know you've been on home recall a time or two, I think, too. But come on, well, that was uh, crazy. As a matter of fact, I appreciate you bringing up the fact, yes, I've been on home recall a couple of times. I never won home recall of the year. However, that's a pretty, pretty substantial deal. Um, the one that I remember, though, most was this one uh, that I hope people enjoy as well. So Harold in the shotgun. From the 28 to throw. Goes to the right side for Crabtree. It's caught. Oh he breaks. Oh, oh, he's going to oh, the Red Raiders. Unbelievable. Touchdown. Red Raiders. Oh, Unbelievable. Oh, Red Raiders. Michael Crabtree has done it. Michael Crabtree makes the catch at the five. Breaks the tackle and scores. There's still one second on the clock. But Texas Tech. Unbelievable, Michael Crabtree. Oh, my gosh, can you believe that? The <laughs> Raiders have defeated the number one ranked team in the country, 39-33. to 33. Now, that one was pretty fun, too. And you talk about memorable, man. So, I, I, I did win Homer Call of the Week, I believe, that week. Didn't get of the year, but it was the Pontiac game-changing play of the year on ESPN that year. And, uh, man, I think that thing was played like a gazillion times, as yours was over. I, I heard yours here in Dallas over and over and over. And that's it's always so cool. gives you little goosebumps every time it plays. You know, that was one of the things that was fun about that, that SMU-UAB moment. Again, those were dark days in SMU yeah. football. And it got the program a little notoriety for the next week. I, I know uh, Fox Sports Southwest ran the call and ran the video yeah. of it a lot. And, uh, I was happy that we at least got a little notoriety for the program, got talked about a lot on the ticket. Hey, by the way, on your call there, there's yeah. a little SMU radio tie-in on that call, too. Oh, yeah? The the year that that happened, uh, Craig Swan had moved on, and John Hampton, another former SMU player, was my color analyst. And uh -huh. he, along with uh, my one-time producer, Ted Gans, you were standing uh -huh. over on the sideline right where that Crabtree pass was completed because I saw nice. him on TV when it happened. Nice, nice. There you go. Oh, there you go. Well, that, yeah, that's, a, that's a cool tie-in. But, I, I, hey, what have you done with that call? Have you done anything? Um, I'll give you the reason that I'm asking that question. So uh, the producer, engineer of, of our broadcast, Steve Pitts, who um, I actually had on the first episode, he, he helped me kind of work out the kinks of Broadcast Booth. Um, so he took that call, 
and he he had it mixed with um, unbelievable the song unbelievable mm-hmm. um, and and back and forth back and forth I play it for you but I'm afraid the copyright wouldn't allow me to post it um, as those things go but um, so we had that and then I took that I took the very end of that call my my daughter actually went to Texas she was at that game with her uh, fiance from Texas and as you can imagine they were devastated at the end of the game she and I have a great relationship so I actually use that as a ringtone only when she calls and so every nice. time she calls I'm like hey Crabtree just scored again and she's like man will you ever ever let that go I go no I'm not gonna let it go just as I'm sure you wouldn't let that other one go I, I can't say that I've done anything unique with it. Uh, I know it still lives on in ticket fame 16 yep. years later, but uh, and it lives on YouTube. I sent you that link, but yeah. somebody I didn't even put that <laughs> together. Somebody else put it together with the uh, the video of it, but uh, it's just one that I know it's out there. Uh, one of my kids a couple years ago, my younger son, said, Hey, did you know this is on YouTube, Dad? That's like, fine. Yeah, I'm very familiar with it, but uh, yeah, we were excited that night. That is fun. So, hey, okay, last year, that, now that was a great year. That was uh, or, or a great fun time that you had in that UAB game in 2005. Last year, 2020, was a little different just from the experience inside the booth. I know we all had this. Describe a little bit about what you guys had to go through with the COVID situation. I'm going to show some pictures up here of uh, your, your broadcast team from last year while you do it. And that's uh, Scott Garner there in the red shirt in the middle and Steve Lansdale. Uh, Steve's the sideline reporter. Scott is now the color analyst, has been for seven years. And, yeah, as you can see, we show up for games wearing masks. Um, We actually attended all but one of our games this season. We did one remote on the football side. Of course, we only played ten because we kept having – cancellations and postponements late in the season didn't even matter of fact the bowl game that smu was selected to play in the frisco bowl wound up being canceled because smu was out with covid um you see there on the the table uh, hand sanitizer that was actually a proud sponsor of uh, smu athletics <laughs> this year it was a new one they were the ones that they were handling all of the uh, sanitizing of the stadium and the seats and everything too because Brilliant. smu had about uh, they did about 25 percent capacity 7200 fans for home games this season you know, the thing that was so weird about it, Brian, and, and I'm, I don't know if you had this same experience, but I went through the whole football season and then subsequently the basketball season, too, and never once did I talk to a coach or a player in person. All of my pregame interviews were done via Zoom, uh, postgame for football. We did it on the phone with Sonny Dykes. We did a Zoom with Tim Jankovic for postgame and basketball. And so just kind of felt disconnected from the team that way. And then, yeah. for sure, the football games, because, uh, like I said, we traveled to several of our road games. A few of them were drive trips, so that made it a little easier. But I always felt like, because there's different protocol here and there, that I yeah. would show up with my mask, I'd walk into my play-by-play booth, and I hardly left. Maybe to go get something to drink, but you know, usually I go wander around the press box before the game, talking to different media people. Maybe I run into some of the assistant coaches. I, yeah. I felt like we weren't supposed to go anywhere. You were supposed to just stay in your booth. And so yeah. it was very isolated feeling all the way around doing the game. Last well, year. there's no doubt about that. In fact, during the beginning, uh, before the season actually started, there was a lot of talk about not being able to do anything. Mm-hmm. And then there was talk about, okay, it's all going to have to be remote. And then it's, well, do you guys feel comfortable enough to be able to go into a booth? Yeah, fortunately, the booth at Tech is huge, so we were able to get some separation there. But as you got into the travel with the team, what Tech did was they created their, and I'm sure a lot of teams did this, you all might have done this too, they created a bubble situation where we had to come in on Friday morning to get tested. Um, They did the rapid test for everybody. If you passed, then you were supposed to go literally on your own, isolate yourself and test it was time to go get on the bus to go to the plane and then once you got to the location uh say it was you know Stillwater or Morgantown or wherever it might be you were supposed to literally not go anywhere you got on the bus yep. you went to the hotel you stayed in your room you got on the bus you went to the game you got on the bus you got on the plane you came home we didn't even get offered that they 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 made their bubble as small as possible and so you know, we, we didn't travel with a team at all. We went to San Marcos to play Texas State. We all drove individually down there. Uh, we did drive as a group to Tulsa for that game. And then we uh-huh. actually, our radio crew flew commercially 
to New Orleans to play Tulane and to Philadelphia to play Temple. Uh, the New Orleans one I wasn't terribly comfortable with because it was probably the first of October, and boy, both flights, both yeah. ways, completely packed. We went to Philadelphia. Shockingly, the plane was half empty, and it was a huge plane. Uh, so that wasn't too bad. But then by the time we got to uh, November, we had a game at East Carolina, which Greenville, North Carolina is not a place to get to on a commercial flight. So yep. that's when our, our GM with uh, Learfield, the, the third party we work for, made the call that we're going to start doing games remotely. And so we did that football game remotely, and then we did all our basketball road games remotely too. So I'm a Learfielder too. So uh, yeah. we're in that same family. Yep, I uh, have been for a, a, a long time. I don't know where you you guys, I think, you might have been Learfield as long as us. I'm not sure about that connection. But, you know, some of the booths uh, did some pretty creative stuff. I know you ran into one that was a little odd. Yes, this was uh, week one, as a matter of fact, at Texas State. And you see the shower curtain that they have put up. <laughs> and I was inside of the shower curtains because I always sit on the left for football. And so the engineer, they put a shower curtain. He sits in the uh, the spot there on the left. It's We call it the catbird seat, and that's where the engineer sits. So they had a shower curtain between me and him, and then a shower curtain between me and Scott on the other side. And I will tell you, the air conditioning vents were on behind the camera here, if you will. So it was hot in the shower booth that I did that game. And we ended up kind of bunching the curtains together at some point because I really don't think they were helping much anyway. So, and that, you know, it ended funny. up being guys I was spending week after week with in a small space anyway. So you kind of have to trust one another at that point. Yeah, you would think so. Um, <laughs> you know, I think the, the, the strangest one that we ran up against was probably Oklahoma State. They had, which is a strange booth anyway, it's literally up on the roof. On the roof, um, yeah, been there. Water. Yeah, and um, so what they did, they created or built some type of a plexiglass apparatus that was on a, um, you know, kind of on a frame that you were supposed to roll up and, and you know, slide between the two of you. And, you know, John and I looked at each other, John Harris, my, my color analyst, looked at, I, looked at each other. We went, do we re really? No. Okay. <laughs> I mean, there was, there, because we had just traveled there, right, from, right on a plane together we stayed in hotels together and you were like we've been a little bit closer than six feet already let's just let's just wing it and go with it so tell me about the remote portion that's one thing I never had to do and I know a lot of broadcasters have had to do that so uh, quickly you know run me through what that was like because that had been totally different it was so Learfield was able to uh, acquire for us a satellite back feed so that we could get it almost right on you know it's like a one second delay it was supposed to have audio with it, too, of the arena. Unfortunately, every time they sent us full audio, which was the TV broadcast, so it wouldn't, we couldn't use that. And so we were like, well, how are we going to make it feel like we're in the arena? And so we had our sports information director for basketball, Herman Hudson, traveled with the same kind of comrics that we used to broadcast on. And we would dial him up at the arena, and he's feeding us just a microphone sitting there on the table so we get the arena sound. And then we're doing it with a Comrex to the radio station so we can send our signal there. And it was pretty convoluted and we're watching it on the satellite feed. And we had a couple games where we didn't have that satellite feed and we had to go straight off of Ooh. TV and we're watching ESPN. And man, there was one game <laughs> we were doing at the University of Houston. It was a Sunday <laughs> afternoon game, a noon game. And ESPN decided they had a two hour window for that game and that's it because oh they had some pre-recorded Pro Bowl stuff they needed to run at 2 o'clock. And at 1.58, we noticed down on the bottom line that the game was moving to ESPN News at 2 o'clock, and we had no idea. We, we did our broadcast from Ford Stadium, by the way, the football stadium at SMU. Uh -huh. yep. We used the TV broadcast booth because it's the biggest room there, and we could leave our gear set up. So, yeah, we see that they're moving the game to ESPN News on us, and we have no idea – where ESPN News is on the uh, cable we're watching, and it turns out it didn't even have ESPN News. And we had somebody else from Millerfield come in, and we had a second TV with an Apple TV, and he's trying to find it on there. And I called uh, one possession off of the game tracker. I called, I think, two possessions off of Hulu on my phone. And then I called <laughs> another possession off of Hulu on my iPad because I thought, wow. oh, I can get it on there. And then finally, they're pointing at me that it's up here on the, the TV way up high at the ceiling. And so we did the last three minutes of a bad loss that way. So, yeah. Wow. And, yeah, and remote it's broadcasting not, wasn't, wasn't fun. Well, and, and it's not like it's not like basketball is going to slow down for you. 
No. You know, I mean, I mean that that juggle must have been, you know, just a tremendous challenge. Hey, congratulations for pulling that <laughs> off. I mean, uh, I, I do know that uh, shortly after that incident and then a few others that were just kind of, you know, tough to do at times, the, the GM with Learfield did assure me this was not the way of the future for us and we would not look to be doing this down the road. So hopefully we're back to normal, I guess, here in 2021. But I do understand that uh, sometimes travel on the road, especially with the basketball group, was a little bit challenging for you. Uh, yeah, this was this photo here was part of our 2015-16 basketball travel. The great Larry Brown there you see on the left side. Um, this was the year that we had the worst travel you could ever have with a charter company. And, and I know people <laughs> don't want to feel sorry for us that we had trouble with charter airplanes. Uh, this was one we were in Philadelphia where we had a frozen engine and sat on the tarmac for hours and that that previous picture the whole team was gathered around an ipad in which we were watching the afc championship game when the uh broncos barely held off the patriots this is me inside of an airplane that we were flying to connecticut and i'm bundled up because when we got off of the plane in the middle of february in hartford connecticut it was warmer outside than it was in the plane it was <laughs> 35 degrees maybe inside that wow plane. and then the next night we flew that same plane home, and they told us that they had fixed the uh, the thermostat issue, but the FAA wanted them to fly at a lower elevation, a lower altitude, in case there was a cabin leak. And so, therefore, at 24,000 feet, we couldn't make it on gas back to Dallas. We had to stop in Memphis for gas. Wow. And then um, there was our infamous flat tire that we had. That's an airplane tire. <laughs> we, went, <Man. laughs> we went to Greenville, <laughs> North Carolina. They dropped us off the night before the game, and the plane left because it had other flights it went and did. And then the plane came back and landed right about the time we got to the airport after the game, and it blew a tire. And guess what they don't have at the airport in Greenville, North Carolina? Hmm. They don't have a jack that can lift a 737 <laughs> because they don't get them there. So we had to wait some place called Newburn, I believe. How they had one, I don't know, is an hour and a half away. A guy had to drive it over. And then when I took that picture there, Larry Brown and I were out looking at this thing and both questioning if anybody knew what they were doing <laughs> and their efforts to change that tire and questioning how we both felt about the safety of the plane after they got done yeah. with this. But in the end, we ended up getting on it. That was maybe a four-hour delay. That frozen engine in Philly in the first picture, that was eight hours. We were oh. delayed on that one. It was, uh, it was a nightmare charter company that we used. We've never used them since that year. Well, we've had a, a couple of those issues as well. Um, I don't travel, so I actually travel to every game. So the, the the home games in Lubbock are actually a road game for me because I live mm -hmm. in Dallas. So, I, But I'm fortunate enough to be able to fly the company plane, Southwest Airlines. Nice plug right here, Southwest. Sure. If you'd like to sponsor Broadcast Booth, you can go right <laughs> ahead on our next episode. Uh, so that, that typically works out pretty well. I go in on Friday night just in case there is some issue and I have to drive. I've only had to do that one time. Mm -hmm. um, but then when I'm traveling on the road with the team, I, I'm obviously on the charter with them at times as well. And uh, I can recall one where we flew into Morgantown and man, it was rough coming in. And that's kind of rough country anyway. And uh, the weight of these planes, I don't think people realize how much weight is is in these airplanes with these football teams that have yeah. you know i don't know how many guys are over 300 pounds a lot more guys are over 250 mm -hmm. you know just about everybody on that plane is is you know large and heavy right <laughs> not to mention yeah. the equipment that's being carried as well so uh, a lot of times the runways are too short right Yep. And you have to go into different locations. This one uh, we flew in and man, that runway, we took up every single inch of it. And you're just, you're grabbing a hold of the armrests. You're looking out the window and you're just saying, please stop in time. I mean, it's, it gets to be hairy. Huntington, West Virginia, because of course it's the home of Marshall. Trust me. Every time yes. in and out of there on a, a football charter was always a, uh, a little bit of a nerve-wracking moment. And, and that's the thing, too, about those travel issues we had that one year. I don't want anybody to feel sorry for me because we had issues with charter flights. But we literally were at the point that season where we were concerned for our safety yeah. week in and week out because of we, we had no idea what the next plane was going to look like and what was going to go wrong with it. 
Yeah, travel is always a, a little dicey, it seems like, um, you know, in those types of issues when you're doing charter stuff like that, uh, especially as many times as you have to travel. I mean, add, add up the numbers. It just, you know, everybody talks about odds. We don't even want to go there. But, <laughs> you know, it does just, it, it's dicey at times. I'm curious, you mentioned NASCAR and the things that you've done with NASCAR. Um, tell me a little bit about that, because I think that's a, a great interest as well. So, you know, while I worked at the ticket for many years, I was doing a weekly auto racing show. Why was I doing it? Because they were looking for somebody to host it. And I said, sure, I'll do it. Because <laughs> I watched racing a little bit and uh, it really got me hooked into it. And so much so that, as I said, back in 14, I was offered a job to go work at Texas Motor Speedway. Uh, still do work there as a contractor now uh, as the public address announcer. As a matter of fact, next weekend they have the NASCAR All-Star Race at uh, TMS, and I'll be doing yep. the PA for that. Awesome. Uh, but yeah, I spent, I spent six years working there. I did a radio show and podcasts and worked in the marketing department and helped produce TV commercials and all kinds of other video content. It was a lot of fun, man. It was a, a crazy world to work in in NASCAR. So I'm thinking that that combination along with uh, the SMU combination and you get a chance to sit down at a table next to Danica, Patrick, and uh, have a little conversation at the SMU forum. Yeah, that was pretty cool. And, you know, and, and it's it's interesting because Danica's, and, and I'd had a few interfaces with her before this one came up, and she can be challenging, to say the least, at times, <laughs> and standoffish. And so I got to meet her beforehand at the little mixer they have, and then we go up for luncheon, and she's sitting right next to me. And I thought, boy, this is going to be a long lunch sitting here because she was the only person <laughs> next to me at the head table. And let me tell you, she was the most engaging lunch partner i've had in many many years she chatted me up and we we had lots of discussions about what the radio world was like and what else i did in the sports world and uh, i think she kind of had felt comfortable because she had done something the day before at uh sema in las vegas i believe and the guy that did the q a with her that day didn't know anything about her and she found out real quick that i knew a lot about her so she was actually very engaging and that was fun i've gotten to do that uh, athletic forum twice SMU trust me when they bring in the NASCAR people because I did it with Daryl Walter one yeah. time too. So that's when they trust me to do that. Well, hey, that turned out to be a great uh, a great connection then for you. I, I'm yeah. I'm interested in talking to you real quick too about another connection, one that I've got with uh, SMU football and with you, and that is with this gentleman, uh, yeah. Sonny Dykes, one of my favorite people in the world, uh, not just coaches but favorite people. So thrilled to see when he was named uh, the head coach at SMU. And, and in fact, uh, a, a quick little story for you. Back when um, he was at Louisiana Tech, I actually had a conversation, and I'm not going to mention the person's name because I don't want to put him on the spot with what happened. Had a conversation with uh, somebody very high up in the uh, SMU football program at that time. And I said, hey, there is a coach out there. You guys need to get your eyeballs on and, and bring him in here the next time there's an opportunity. Which, by the way, there was an opportunity very quickly thereafter mm -hmm. before they hired June Jones. And uh, I said, Sonny Dykes, man, he is a guy you, you really ought to put your eyes on. Guy that recruits Dallas Forth works so well blah 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 you know went through the whole deal with them and they go well actually we have our sights set on somebody with a pretty big name that we're going to be bringing in first uh, or now it turned out to be mm -hmm. June Jones and so you know obviously Sonny goes on to Cal ends up mm -hmm. you know didn't finish great there and so fortunately for for SMU he was available at a time when uh, they then once again needed him and boy what a what a great pickup that's been he's been uh Nothing short of fantastic. Uh, three years. The last two have been, you know, terrific. I mean, heck, the first year with not a very good team almost uh, put them into a bowl game. They were playing for one in the final week. Um, bowl games the last two years. Top 25 rankings the last two years. We hadn't seen that since I think it was either 84 or 85 that SMU had last been ranked. And he's had them in the top 25 each of the last two years. Uh, 2019 was the one was amazing. It was an 8 no start. Top 25, playing the primetime Saturday night game at Memphis, who was also top 25. Uh, unfortunately, the winning streak ended there. But uh, he's really done an amazing job with the program. He's figured out this transfer market a lot, I think, because that's kind of how they're living right now. Um, and it seems to be working out. You know, the Shane Bouchelle transfer sure worked out for him pretty well. 
and uh, he's uh, really energized the fan base. I mean, it, it, it's, you know, this is one of the things that, that got hit by COVID last year. They were on pace at SMU to have the best season ticket sale in the history of Ford Stadium, which opened in 2000. Wow. And then COVID hits and they go 25% capacity. And so 7,200 were there instead. But uh, my understanding is ticket sales are off and flying for this coming season because they're planning a 100% capacity this year. That is fantastic. I mean, it's just it, it's so great to see because, as I mentioned earlier, and you know this quite well now, having so much experience uh, or so much time with him. Although, as you mentioned, twenty twenty kind of knocked that out a little bit. Just uh, such a terrific guy, great family. Love to see what's going on there. Hey, listen, uh, come to the end of the broadcast booth uh, session here, but I've got to tell you, this has been a, a blast. I really appreciate your time and your stories. Uh, been some great ones, Rich. Awesome, Brian. Hey, I had seen uh, on social media recently you started this project. You reached out to me this week, and uh, glad you did. It's been fun. Love talking a little uh, SMU and a little broadcasting uh, with one of my longtime connections here in this business. Thanks, Brian. All right. It has been great. I appreciate it. Rich Phillips, SMU, the voice of SMU Athletics, our guest on Episode 4. A reminder, this is where you can take a look at uh, all things Broadcast Booth. And don't forget, also following us on podcasts if you would like. You can do that through whatever is your favorite subscription service. Until the next episode, which uh, again, looking forward to some great stories from a play-by-play professional. So long, everybody. Thanks for listening. <laughs>